So hi, I'm Chris Asbell, one of the assistant professors here at University of Kentucky in Pediatric Otolaryngology. And today I'm going to talk about management of uh, trach decannulation uh, in pediatric population. Uh, nothing to disclose. Our learning objectives today, um, I'm going to review indications for uh, ped trach placement and the potential complications of long-term tracheostomy use in kids. Um, I want everybody to understand the factors that specifically influence decannulation in the pediatric population compared to adults. Uh, and then I want uh, to make sure we discuss the guidelines and, and protocols about decannulation in peds patients, and then the evidence supporting or not supporting uh, various techniques uh, and tests for decannulation, what some of those controversies are. Um, so we'll first just go into a brief history of pediatric trachs. The first successful one was uh, described, published in uh, French literature in 1620. That's Nicolas Papicot, and he was a French anatomist. He uh, had a case report of a successful trach in a teenager who was tried to steal gold and when caught, tried to swallow a small bag of gold and the bag became lodged in his esophagus. And so he presented with acute airway distress and no one could dislodge um, the coin bag. And so uh, Dr. Habico made an incision, what they called a bronchotomy at the time, uh, inserted a small tube and uh, this allowed the patient to recover from the acute respiratory distress. They eventually um, helped the kid by using a um, lead rod to force it transorally down the esophagus to dislodge um, the bag of coins. Um, there was another successful case report of a trach in the 1700s, also in France, uh, used to remove a foreign body, actually a bean, in a, uh, a young child. It became a more popular procedure in the mid 1800s uh, initially just for emergent treatment for acute infections. And at the time, it was commonly diphtheria. The most successful and uh, largest published study from this time was in 1833. Um, and there was a study of 200 children with diphtheria and acute airway obstruction, um, of which 50 survived after having a, a trait placed. In the early 1900s, um, there was more and more use of pediatric trachs for children with uh, polio specifically, uh, but other neurologic disorders leading to res respiratory failure and, and, and necessitating long-term ventilator use. And then in the latter half of the 20th century, we've had significantly expanded indications, um, particularly for uh, prolonged ventilation in kids with underlying cardiac and pulmonary disease. Uh, the pictures on the right, that is Dr. Dr. Habico, uh, and that is uh, to the right of him, his case report uh, from that foreign body, uh, from that bag of gold that was removed in the emergent, what they call bronchotomy, uh, that was performed. And then this is one of his uh, later teaching diagrams, just talking about uh, placement of the incision. And then in the bottom right of that picture, you can see um, the trach tube they had fashioned at the time. So historically, trachs were used only in kids for emergent indications, acute infections and acute airway obstruction, which often overlap. Uh, now, obviously, our indications have increased uh, substantially. Uh, number one, ventilator dependence. So in kids with cardiac or pulmonary issues and prolonged um, bit dependence, and then you have all seen them, they may end up spending uh, months or more in the ICU uh, and need a way of easy mechanical ventilation. Pulmonary toilet is particularly for kids with underlying genetic disorders or cerebral palsy, for example, also very common. Uh, any form of airway obstruction um, that can't be fixed um, endoscopically, that can't be improved can often end up with a, uh, with a trach. Still, there are some cases of acute infection, uh, 
um, that necessitate a trach. Um, certainly tumors, masses, and then neuromuscular disorders. So much wider, um, wider use. Since the 1980s, the rate of tracheostomies performed in children compared to all hospitalized children has actually stayed the same. But there's been a significant increase in the mean duration of how long kids have this trach. Um, and the reason for those two seemingly conflicting statements is because there has been less use of peds trachs for short-term issues, airway obstruction, infection, but a significant increase in survival of very young premature infants with complex medical problems. Uh, and the graph on the right is from a study published a couple years ago out of Sweden, and it's just showing the survival percentage of uh, very young, extremely premature infants from the mid-1980s to uh, just a few years ago. And you can see these substantial increases, um, both in the survival rate for um, borderline or premature births and how that age for survival is decreasing. And so now, you know, nearly 50% or about 50% of kids born at 22 weeks gestation can survive. And those kids have a lot of issues and you've all seen those, I'm sure, um, but often require prolonged mechanical ventilation. So that's a reason for um, these kids had now having a trach over two years on average. Um, Long-term trach use in children, similar to adults, does have uh, a lot of potential complications. And so those are morbidity, mortality, um, Mucus plugging is certainly one of the most feared ones. Uh, pediatric trachs often don't have that inner cannula that gets changed. They are smaller in diameter uh, because of the kid's small airway size. And so they are then more prone to mucus plugging. Caregivers, both in the hospital and in an outpatient setting, are um, taught on emergent trach changes, sectioning, how to recognize mucus plugging, but it is still a risk and is a potential source of mortality. Um, chronic infection, acute tracheitis, uh, from having an open wound, uh, skin flora, not being able to clear uh, respiratory secretions does lead to an increase in infections both inside of the airway and at the stoma. Granulomas, um, both in the lumen above the trach and um, granulation tissue around the stoma are a big problem and that can lead to both airway obstruction if there's a large granuloma on the inside and can lead to worsen wound breakdown on the outside of the stoma in the skin of the neck. Superstomal tracheal collapse we'll talk about in a little bit but you basically have this long-term um, silicone plastic tube uh, pushing on a part of the tracheal wall. Eventually you get degradation of the integrity of the cartilage and you get an acquired tracheomalacia effectively in that subglottic superstomal uh, space on the inside. We worry about skin breakdown. Obviously, there are a lot of good protocols in place now, both for inpatient immediate post-op and for long-term trait care to help prevent skin breakdown. Uh, but it is something that we always worry about, and it's something that, that does happen. Uh, swallowing dysfunction because of the often inability to um, close the glottis with a trach in place and generate that positive pressure. And because of the surgery itself, uh, fixing some of those uh, infrahyoid muscles, it interferes with swallowing. And a lot of kids with a trach are not safe to swallow, at least not with a completely regular diet, and end up needing a diet modifications, needing a G2 for that. And then lastly, there's mortality. Um, rate. It's the trach specific mortality is around maybe one to two percent. Uh, and certainly the overall mortality in kids with trach is much higher owing to the other complex medical issues. Kids with trachs have a significant increased rate of, comp, uh, rate of hospitalizations. And so there's more things that can go wrong. They're more frequently admitted to the hospital. Um, and then there's the increased healthcare costs. The initial cost of the trait placement hospitalization in the U.S. is over $100,000. Uh, and obviously that doesn't factor in cost of ongoing medical supplies, 
cost of travel, cost of additional hospitalizations in the future. It's a significant burden to the families and hospitals and um, to the health insurance as well. There's also a very well documented negative psychosocial impact, not just on the kids, but on their caregivers. Um, and there have been several good published surveys uh, describing, you know, anxiety with trait care, trait changes, worry about complications and mortality that can happen, uh, parental concern for a child's physical and emotional health, and then the stress of just the, the time uh, and effort it takes to take good care of a kid with a trach at, at home. Uh, not to mention the inevitable financial stress on the family, regardless of, of insurance or anything else. There's, there's a lot that goes into the taking care of these kids. So our eventual goal in any PEDS trait is decannulation. Um, overall decannulation rates in public studies range from 30 to 75%. Obviously that varies widely based on the underlying indication for the trait and the comorbidities. Um, and so when you have a kid with a trait come into your clinic, how do you determine who is ready for decannulation. Some of these kids you may have been following since you performed the training. You may have been following, following them for two or three years and you uh, know their history and sometimes you might get a referral um, and a kid just comes into your office with a trait and they want it out and how do you decide who's ready to get that trait out and who's not? Um, and why can't you use the same algorithm that people do with adults? In an adult, you downsize, you make sure the underlying problem is fixed. Uh, you may cap, you may not. Um, you scope them, you usually don't take them to the OR, and then you can get the trach out, and they do very well uh, with that. So I want to spend this next section talking about specific factors that prevent you from doing that same kind of adult care in the pediatric population. And so a lot of issues that influence readiness for children to uh, undergo decannulation. Upper uh, airway anatomy, upper airway obstruction, whether that is the underlying issue for the trach or something else that develops in childhood is something that we have to worry about. Certainly vocal cord mobility with um, comorbidities, whether they're neurologic, whether it's iatrogenic um, from a PDA, a ligation, you do have to worry and you do have to document vocal cord mobility in kids. Uh, the status of the subglottis, a lot of these kids with ongoing ventilator dependence as a young age was because of chronic lung disease, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and their neonates uh, who are very, very premature, so at risk for subglottic stenosis anyway. And they likely had a prolonged period of extubation, often for months. Um, that could have led to acquired uh, subglottic stenosis. The suprastomal granulation tissue inside the lumen and the tracheomalacia, whether congenital or acquired, very important. We'll talk about the size of the trach tube relative to the size of an airway in kids. Certainly lung status, um, how healthy their lungs are, how they've grown and developed. Concern for aspiration, uh, which may not always be overt. Neurologic status, if there are underlying disorders, any kind of comorbidities uh, that could result in repeat hospitalizations, repeat ventilator dependence are important to consider. And then most importantly, just like in adults, you want to make sure that the initial indication for the trach has completely resolved. Um, so we'll talk about a few of these issues, particularly um, ones that are different from adults, but does the child have functioning lungs? And so if you have a former 24 week uh, infant who was on the vent in the NICU for a month, was discharged home, maybe on the vent day and night, maybe has been weaned to nighttime only vent, you wanna have good documentation of exactly how much time they have been on a vent, how long they've been off the vent, what kind of oxygen are they needing, and you know, are their lungs really healthy? And that's where one, a multidisciplinary approach is really important. Having these kids 
uh, evaluated in a multidisciplinary clinic with pediatric pulmonology is very important. Um, these kids likely are all are followed by pulmonology, but sometimes you find people that have kind of missed follow-up and kind of lost in the system that, that don't have that follow-up, and it's important to get before considering the accumulation. The other thing that I have uh, seen in my short practice um, so far is that families may be a little bit misleading. They want the trach out, and if the kid is coming to your office without, you know, without oxygen, without a vent, um, that's great, but you may get a little bit of misleading information when it comes to how long they have been off the vent or do they really do well at night? Um, are they on any oxygen ever? Do they ever desat or do we really monitoring their pulse ox? And you know, while no family I think would intentionally lie, these families are motivated to get the trach out. And so with anything, I, I think it's super important to not just rely on what the family tells you, but make sure you have documentation from the other providers or from the care facility or um, home nursing, whatever it is to, to make sure that the kid is as healthy as, as advertised. Uh, and it's important to have honest conversations with the family that if you rush this process, um, there's a higher risk of complications, a higher risk of recannulation and we'll put the trick back in. Second, can the, can the kid protect his airway? Um, and so that is the ability to handle secretions, both from a neurologic status uh, and from a swelling uh, aspect. Sometimes these kids will have silent aspiration of secretions because they can't protect their airway as well. Um, some of them may be on complete oral feeds and, and doing great. Uh, I certainly don't advocate getting a swallow study in every one. I do think there's an important role for uh, speech and language pathology to help us assess these kids and make sure they're, they're on an appropriate diet and make sure there's no um, signs or symptoms of aspiration. That's something that um, is a big red flag for uh, trach removal. If you remove a trach too soon and the kid is just drowning in secretions, aspirating, um, and can't protect his airway, there's high likelihood for a subsequent uh, pulmonary infection and you could very well end up having to replace the trach. Upper airway anatomy, very important. Usually uh, the average age of getting the trach out is somewhere between two and three. And these young children, like any other children, can have big tonsils and adenoids. And uh, that's something that may be asymptomatic because they're not breathing through their oral cavity and uh, nasal cavity. Uh, but it's really important to assess on exam in the clinic and to assess um, adenoids with the nasal endoscopy. Um, can go overlooked if you're really focused on a lot of other complex problems that these kids may have. Uh, micronathia, retronathia, uh, the rest of the indications, the rest of the upper airway concerns are all things that may very well have led to uh, needing to trach in the first place. Um, and as mentioned before, you just wanna make sure that the problems that led to the trach are resolved, are fixed. Vocal fold, Immobility, uh, congenital, can be from an underlying uh, syndrome, neurologic disorder, Chiari malformation, uh, PDA ligation, um, um, but it's relatively common in kids. And it's important to uh, scope the patient while spontaneously breathing, whether that's a, a flexible nasal laryngoscopy in clinic or as part of your examination, uh, operative endoscopy in the OR, you wanna make absolutely sure that they have um, at least one fully mobile vocal cord. These kids are, are not using their glottis to breathe. And so it's again, a symptom that could be there. You could have bilateral cord paralysis um, and be asymptomatic from it because they've never had to breathe through that area before. Subglottic stenosis may very well have been a, a reason and indication for the trach in the first place. It's easily assessed via bronchoscopy. And it's something that while the trach is in place is the perfect time to try to fix, uh, whether that's with uh, serial endoscopic treatment, dilations, incisions, and, and injections, or whether it's something that is going to end up needing an, an open treatment if there is a maybe high grade two or, or higher stenosis, uh, something that certainly needs to be resolved prior to decannulation. And as mentioned before, these kids in this population, the long-term trait kids, 
because of the trait, because of of the, their underlying pathology and medical course are going to have a much higher rate of subglottic stenosis. Granulation tissue. So it's the most common uh, intraluminal complication of a long-standing tracheostomy tube. And you get this mechanical irritation of the tracheomucosa from, from a silicone tube. And you get this granulation scar tissue that forms there. It can be minimal, but it can also grow to be completely obstructing the lumen above the trach. Uh, very easily assessed on endoscopy, and there are a variety of ways to excise this in the operating room, whether uh, minimal areas that can be uh, either lasered or picked off uh, with a forceps endoscopically, or transtomal resection with a hook and scissors, with a microbreeder with sharp dissection. Um, but it's something that could easily cause a child to fail, but thankfully is easy, easily fixed. The suprastomal collapse, almost like an acquired tracheomalacia, you get from this long term pressure on the cartilage and the rings above the, the train. And you get this um, can be complete anterior posterior collapse. Picture A on the right side uh, shows the patient spontaneously breathing with complete collapse above, uh, above the stoma with, with no trachea. And then with positive pressure, you can open that up, but it's something um, that is very important to identify. Um, prior to decannulation, you may very well need uh, um, a resection of that tissue, a stenting on the outside, an anterior uh, split, uh, just something to open up that airway and to provide a little bit more support. And that's another reason it's very important to have uh, spontaneous breathing uh, when you're doing any kind of evaluation on a trait kid's uh, airway to assess these things that may not be evident um, in, all, in all situations with a lot of positive pressure. Um, tracheostomy tube size is important in kids and adults. Um, in adults, you typically downsize, um, but it's a little bit more important in kids. In this formula, you're seeing two different um, ways of writing um, the hagen uh, Poiseuille equation or Poiseuille's law, which relates to the resistance of flow in relation to the radius. And the big point here is that resistance is proportional to uh, radius to the fourth power, um, which means doubling a radius of an airway decreases the resistance by 16 fold. Conversely, treating the airway by half increases the resistance um, a, significant, a significant amount. And so in kids where you have less space uh, to begin with, a small trait tube can obstruct a much more um, a higher percentage of the cross-sectional area and lead to even higher um, increase in resistance. Um, so in an adult, you may have a transverse diameter of 15 to 20 millimeters on average. And so a cross-sectional area average about 300 millimeters squared. Uh, a 4 0 Shiley trait tube, so your typical smallest tube that you downsize to prior to the annulation has about 70 millimeters of cross-sectional area. So that's a 24% reduction in the cross-sectional area and just a 1.7 um, times increase in resistance. Um, mild, but not significant enough to really hurt things. In a kid, so your average two-year-old um, who's at 50th percentile on the growth curve uh, um, has about an eight millimeter transverse diameter and cross-sectional area of 50 millimeters squared. And so your smallest trach that you would probably safely use um, as an outpatient would be a 3.0 Shiley. still has an outer diameter of nearly five millimeters. And so that cross-sectional area is 18, which is over a third of the patient's airway. Uh, because it's radius to the fourth power, you end up with a substantial increase in resistance, um, like at least two and a half, four, 2.4 times. This is a simplification uh, because there are a lot of other factors in fluid dynamics in the airway. You have to worry about it's not all laminar flow. It's not a regular uh, cylinder because you have awkward areas. There's variations in diameter. There's um, tracheomalacia. There's collapse. And so there are a lot of other things that make it more complicated than the simple math here. Uh, but the point is in a smaller airway to begin with, the tube takes up a lot more space, and so you get much higher resistance than you would 
uh, and an adult with a small tube. And you are often limited um, in downsize because you still want them to have a safe tube. You could put a 2 trach in them, but then your risk of mucus plugging is significantly higher. Um, and if the kid is going to be home for days to weeks with a very small trach, um, you would worry about um, potential complications from that. Some people don't even need, don't even downsize to a 3O because of the risk of mucus plugging. Um, so our third objective is to talk about the current guidelines and some of the issues. Knowing all that we know now about what makes pediatric trach accumulation difficult, what makes it special, um, what are our guidelines, what does the literature show we should do? And so um, there's been a lot written on this. Um, there was a, a 2013 um, consistent con, uh, consensus statement from the Academy uh, on, on a lot of aspects of tracheostomy care. Um, this used um, the modified Delphi method and a Likert scale um, to assess um, 80 or 90 statements on trait care assessed by a, a group of experts, people uh, in multi, uh, multiple disciplines, all experienced in trait care. And it is not a you know, scientific study, but it's what do people who are well-trained and well-experienced think it is reasonable, is good uh, and appropriate for trait care. And there were several uh, strong statements in uh, regards to decannulation in children. Uh, almost universally, bronchoscopy needs to be performed um, prior to decannulation to ensure a patent airway. Uh, the recommendation is for that to be within 30 days of uh, decannulation. I think uh, a lot of protocols you'll see out there, in most places it's an endoscopy at the time, at the hospitalization, within a day or two of decannulation, uh, just to ensure that the airway anatomy is appropriate for decannulating. You need a flexible laryngoscopy to confirm at least one uh, mobile vocal fold. You want no aspiration events. Again, not necessarily uh, requesting a swallow study for every patient, but there should not be signs, symptoms, or concern for aspiration. And if there is, that's when a swallow study needs to be done to make sure that this patient is safe. No ventilator assistance. They don't give a, a strict time on how long uh, that should be, but it is very, very important. Um, they recommend capping for several weeks during the day, particularly for children older than two. Uh, they do acknowledge that for children younger than two, because of the airway issues we just talked about, capping may not be feasible because of the significant cross-sectional area uh, of the trachea that is obstructed uh, even with a small trach tube. Uh, and then they recommend to consider other tests, whether that's a cap sleep study, nighttime hospitalized capping trial, cap exercise test, to prove that the child is ready for a decannulation. And these were all um, graded on this Likert scale that you see a uh, consistent consist, uh, consensus statement for all of these means that they were all on average of seven or higher with no outliers. Um, so it was very, very helpful guideline um, to put out there, and it, but it didn't address some issues. It doesn't talk about the exact timing of bronchoscopy. It doesn't talk about the length of not requiring related assistance. It doesn't talk about specifics as far as the length of capping trials, um, what constitutes a successful cap sleep study, doesn't mention downsizing, doesn't mention uh, fenestrated trach tubes, and doesn't mention specific hospital durations, specific hospital protocols. Um, and so because of that, there have been um, numerous articles over the past seven years since that was published looking at these issues. And so if you search for this on, on PubMed, you can see the little graph on the left showing how popular of a topic um, this is right now in the literature. So the last few years, you know, 20 plus articles per year looking at that. And a lot of it is people describing their results, uh, describing uh, complications and kind of their protocols, what might work best uh, for most patients. And so I want to go through a few of those with you today. Um, this first uh, case series uh, was in 2015, so just a couple years after the protocol, out of Cincinnati, 
and um, they had 59 patients with a total of 78 capped overnight uh, sleep studies. And they were basically looking at these, all these sleep studies to try to figure out what factors in the sleep study determine whether or not this patient was eventually going to be successfully decannulated versus not successfully decannulated. And so they subdivided the 59 patients into two groups uh, after the fact, based on whether they got decannulated and looked at various factors in the sleep study. And using a logistic regression analysis found that the apnea hypopnea index and the maximum entitled CO2 were, were significant for predicting success or failure. Um, and so their successful, successful decannulation group had an obstructive index less than 1.7 and had a maximum entitled CO2 of no higher than 46 uh, millimeters mercury. And so basically that put them in, the, you know, in a mild uh, sleep apnea range, a very mild sleep apnea range, that could still be um, decannulated. They, at the conclusion, suggest a protocol, obviously assessing clinical readiness, basically correction of the underlying problem, flexible laryngoscopy, um, appropriate downsizing and capping during the day, bronchoscopy, and then a sleep study um, prior to decannulation and hospitalization. Uh, at the time of the study, they, they state they were using the sleep studies on about a quarter of their patients. So it's not, again, necessary for maybe every patient, uh, but it is effective and there are uh, some things we can maybe uh, glean from the sleep studies to determine whether a kid is gonna have a successful decannulation or not. Um, this retrospective case series out of, out of Minnesota the next year um, looked at 35 kids uh, all under 18 uh, with a more simplified decannulation protocol. There was operative laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy, all flexible uh, to avoid stenting the airway. Um, and then if the airway was deemed appropriate, uh, basically open anatomy appropriate for decannulation, the trach was removed in the operating room the child monitored overnight in an ICU setting and then discharged on post-op of day one. They had no immediate failures, so no failures within the first week, uh, but did have a couple patients that had to come back uh, weeks to months later uh, and be uh, recanulized. One with severe OSA and Michael Nathian, who ended up needing a, a mandibular distraction. And another one um, developed a subglottic stenosis or had a subglottic stenosis that became uh, clinically significant enough that the kid eventually required uh, an LTR. Um, this case series um, out of Iowa, who has a very extensive protocol uh, published on their website, uh, uh, looked at 26 decannulations over 11 years. Uh, these were all in younger patients, similar to the uh, um, similar to the first study. Uh, and of those 26, 22 were uh, successful. They recommended certainly operative endoscopy, as, as everyone does, and then creation of a fenestrated trach tube during that endoscopy and ensuring adequate um, positioning of the fenestrated trach. So basically that, that there is a defect, a hole in the curve of, of the trach so that when positioned appropriately in the child, uh, it allows excellent airflow up through the glottis. They would then have the kid capped with the fenestrated trach for about 24 hours, at least overnight. Um, and then that trach was removed on the day after the uh, capped fenestrated trach was left in, if the patient did well, and then they were discharged home usually the next day. Um, they did have four that failed. Um, kids that ended up needing mandibular distraction, kids that developed acute viral infections during that hospitalization, um, and then kids that needed, uh, ended up needing a tracheal reconstruction later down the line. Um, so the two kind of things that vary among a lot of these um, protocols are, are capping, uh, downsizing, um, and then along with the, the sleep study. And so capping certainly can predict decannulation success. If a kid does well uh, capped, um, you expect that they will acclimate uh, to the change in the airway uh, physiology and pressure after the trach is removed. 
um, there is the concern with uh, a cross-sectional area decrease. But with downsizing, benefits are you just decrease the amount of blocked airway, blocked air um, within the tracheal lumen, so you give them more space to breathe, but you have that risk of mucus plugging. Um, there is a study, uh, the study out of CHOP back in 2015, um, didn't specifically address uh, concerns about capping, but they had a, a large group, including a large group under three years old, so smaller airways, that all tolerated um, capping. All the ones that were successfully decannulated and stayed decannulated tolerated capping. They actually had five patients in that study who were a little bit symptomatic during capping, didn't tolerate it well, and end up getting decannulated, and four of those five had the trait replaced. And so one of their conclusions from that was that, you know, it may not be perfect, but it is a good predictor. And if a kid can't tolerate the cap, you should be wary, um, certainly, of removing that trait. Um, the other issue is with the capped sleep study. There has been debate, um, even before the guidelines were published in 2013, over what constitutes a favorable sleep study. Um, and then again, concerns over the area, um, blockage of the um, tracheal cross-sectional area. Um, and patients with mild sleep apnea seem to show that they'll, they will do well with decannulation. That goes back to the uh, Cincinnati study that showed their average successful decannulated kids may have had some mild sleep apnea with an AHI under two, uh, but still tolerated de decannulation. Um, and that maybe corresponds with what you see in a general pediatric population. There are a lot of kids out there with some snoring and mild sleep apnea that just do just fine. Um, and these kids may do well. Also, um, studies have shown that combining the sleep study with endoscopy uh, offers a superior predictive value over the endoscopy alone. Uh, with any kid at this point, you know that you're going to get an operative endoscopy prior to degenulation. And so if you add a sleep study to that, your predictive value of who may tolerate the, the trach removal is a little bit higher. Downsides of a cat sleep study, uh, limited availability, cost, it's just a resource intensive process. And so uh, it's different at different centers. Some places may have you know, robust inpatient pediatric sleep centers that can accommodate this. And a lot of other hospitals don't have access to that. And so I never saw a paper that recommended a cap sleep study on every patient. I just don't think that's feasible, but it is a good tool with maybe somebody that you're worried about or, or special situations or kids with other medical issues, comorbidities happening. Um, so conclusions from all this, um, you consider all the factors that make pediatric decannulation more complex than in the adult population. Prior to decannulation kids, you will always perform an endoscopy. That's both the, the laryngoscopy to a sensible full function and then a full airway endoscopy to make sure that the patient is ready uh, for the trait to come out. And then make sure that the underlying reason for the trait placement has, has resolved. And that's where your multidisciplinary approach uh, is essential. Uh, with both pulmonary and speech. Um, there are a lot of guidelines, and I, certainly the, the um, Academy's clinical guidelines are very important to follow, and a lot of great protocols out there of people that have done it successfully. Uh, but I think in the end, you have to individualize the approach to a specific patient. And so not every patient needs every study, not every patient will tolerate downsizing, will be limited sometimes of what you can do. Um, but you have to tailor your approach um, to your patient. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you for watching. Perfect. Thank you.